Father, give us your blessings here tonight as we open mysterious places. Uh, you've uh, invited us to come here and kind of eavesdrop on a very personal conversation, this protracted dialogue of four chapters with Job. Uh, you certainly did answer. He wanted to hear from you, and you gave him plenty to think about. But, Lord, here we are also upon whom the ends of the world have come, and uh, we get to uh, learn, so to speak, on uh, poor Job's dime. So help us, uh, I pray, to internalize all lessons here to, uh, uh, to in a sense, Lord, uh, pull back some of the curtains of eternity and uh, to understand, in a very limited sense, the mystery of God. So we thank you for Jesus because uh, what an awesome moment it would be to have to appear before the living God without an advocate. You sent to us not only a savior, but a comforter. So uh, be with us tonight, Lord. Uh, we will glorify you in all that we teach. We pray that the anointing of your spirit would be upon each of us to be teachers and students in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I want you to turn to uh, Job 38, and uh, what do we have? We, we have the answer to Job's prayer, which was he wanted an audience with the creator of the universe. Be careful what you ask for, beloved. You know, we want God to answer our questions, right? And Job wanted that in the worst way, and he, he got the divine visitation in a whirlwind, a cyclone. Uh, so it all... Uh, I can only imagine poor Job there's on the dung hill, ashes on his head and uh, skin all broken up with some form of leprosy and uh, three friends jabbing at him constantly and persecuting him and uh, he's in tears most of the time and then what do we have but um, Elihu, the forerunner of God comes and sets the stage and gets Job into a quiet spirit uh, where uh, he will actually be able then to, uh, to hear what God has to tell him. And so here the Lord comes in a mighty whirlwind. Uh, so um, perhaps even Job is thinking, oh, finally my answer, I'm going to die. And the whirlwind comes right up to him and stops in front of him. And the voice of the Almighty comes forth from it uh, in that uh, rather dramatic entry. And he uh, begins by asking Job a question, one of almost 90-some uh, questions that he'll now probe Job with in the next four chapters. Uh, they are unanswerable, irresolvable questions, as most of ours are, by the way. Uh, and uh, posing them before an inscrutable God is probably a fool's errand. But nonetheless, uh, now what do we have but God uh, is reversing the tables? It, Job had been asking God questions. Now Job is going to be asked questions of God. And now Job is on uh, the prosecution uh, stand, and, uh, and, and the Lord himself is going to pose these questions to him. So he begins with uh, verse 2. So who is this that darkeneth who counsel by words without knowledge? So it's a rebuke immediately. You can see that the tenor is set immediately here. Gird up now thy loins as a man, uh, for I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Now behold the goodness and severity of God. In some cases here we might look at this and say, isn't he being unduly harsh? Look at everything that Job has gone through. Isn't there some sympathy? Uh, well, let's not forget here that uh, the Lord of heaven and earth, the maker of heaven and earth, he will certainly do what is right, won't he? So uh, he's doing what is necessary here to bring Job to the place of total submission. And so uh, he begins with these very difficult questions and they silence Job immediately. There's nothing to say. When we stand before God, Romans 3.19 says, every mouth will be stopped, all the world will become guilty before God. There's nobody going to be answering God, nobody uh, uh, bold enough to uh, question God's motives. In that hour, uh, everyone stands before him guilty and uh, hopefully saved. Uh, one of those old commentators that I have, you know, I use the pulpit commentary so much, but uh, uh, it's actually uh, a digest of several different uh, writers from uh, the 18th and 19th centuries. And uh, he describes this way, nothing can be conceived more awful than this appearance of Jehovah. Nothing more sublime than the manner in which this speech is introduced. 
thunders, lightnings, a whirlwind announce his approach. All creation trembles at his presence. At the blaze of his all-piercing eye, every disguise falls off. The stateliness of human pride, the vanity of human knowledge, sink into their original nothing. The man of understanding, the man of age and experience, he who desires nothing more than to argue to the point, the point with God, he that would maintain his ways to his face, confounded and struck dumb at his presence, is ready now to drop into dissolution and repents in dust and ashes. This speech is addressed particularly to Job, not only because he is the principal personage referred to in the book, but particularly because he had indulged in language of murmuring and complaint. God designed to bring him to a proper state of mind before he appeared openly for his vindication. It is the purpose of God in his dealings with his people to bring them to a proper state of mind before he appears as their vindicator and friend. And hence, their trials are often prolonged. And when he appears, he seems at first to come only to rebuke them. Job had indulged in very improper feelings, and it was needful that those feelings should be subdued before God would finally manifest himself as his friend and address him in words of consolation and restitution. I would say, well said. So we spoke last week, I think we ended here with this concept, the folly of questioning God. Uh, and Jesus had those fools that questioned him, uh, self-righteous hypocrites, putting Jesus up uh, for prosecution. Certain of the scribes, though, at the end, had no more questions to ask him. They posed their questions, and Jesus politely answered their questions. And then, after they were silenced, it said that they durst not ask him any more questions at all. They were done. And then Jesus asked them a question, and um, uh, obviously they couldn't answer. So Romans 9, if we take it out of its immediate context, which is a national con context, we can certainly apply it to each individual. So nay, but O oh man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to the thing who formed it, why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay and of the same lump to make uh, one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? So we'll leave uh, the, uh, the nature of God alone because he's totally, Im absolutely perfect, impeccably perfect. And so what he does is right. So the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how are unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Or who hath been his counselor? Or who hath given unto him and shall be recompensed unto him? For of him and through him and to him be all things, to whom be glory forever. You know the last word, yeah. So God, uh, God doesn't expect us to understand his ways because they're higher than our ways and his thoughts higher than our thoughts. And so things that befuddle us and flummox us uh, are easily answered when we stand in his presence. It'll all be understood and we'll say with the ransomed on high, he doeth all things well. We'll say great is our Lord and greatly to be praised. Great is our Lord and of great power is understanding, is infinite. And uh, Isaiah 40 tells us, hast thou known, these are questions that can't be answered, hast thou heard that the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. So we have uh, all of this in concert through the Bible that uh, indicates this uh, attribute of God. So uh, mysterious knowledge to say the least. So where was thou, says uh, God to Job, where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding, who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest who hath, who hath stretched the line upon it, whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened, or who laid the cornerstones uh, thereof. So these, uh, I know we mentioned this last week, these are kind of building concepts. Uh, 
Uh, so we have the architect of the universe here, for he looked, uh, we look for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. So there'll be no mistakes with the foundations he lays, like those people in, poor people in uh, Florida. Imagine that, uh, you go to bed thinking all is well, and you are crushed to death. Um, you know, life is evanescent, and uh, the sudden things can happen to us that we didn't expect. You know, you don't know what can happen next. <laughs> I'm downstairs working a little bit on my, uh, some of my sermons here, and I look out the window, and a black bear walked across the back of our patio. Now here we had just spent, whatever, a week in the Rocky Mountains and never saw a bear. I just saw one in my own backyard. And I, I don't, that's amazing. It's, but I mean, if I was sitting outside, I might have been the bear's lunch. We really don't know what's going to happen next, do we? So, uh, so wonderful to know that uh, our days, our times are in his hands. I have a sad uh, announcement for you here. Tom Smart and Lori Smart's daughter passed away this morning. Um, the youngest, Sarah. It's been a life of trouble and uh, a sad ending, to say the least. But um, I was just speaking with them, inconsolable grief. So, um, so you know what? Every day we get up, we, we just recognize how brief life is and that you hold closely all those things that you think are yours and will be yours forever, and, and they could be taken in a, in a moment of time. They might not be there. So uh, let's do all that we can in the name of Jesus Christ to make sure that they're all ready to meet the Master. Okay, so here's where I want to kind of uh, land uh, in the passage. Uh, I want to talk about the angels a bit. Now we know when uh, Jesus was born, the angels appear in a heavenly host and they're praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest on earth, peace, goodwill to men. And they're there. Uh, denominated by this expression, the heavenly host. So I was talking last week about, well, when were the angels created? So we have this passage in Job, where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth, declare if thou hast understanding. So he's talking about the beginning of time here. This is all metaphorical language. So when he, when he first begins in this ex nihilo uh, creation, he just speaks and it happens. And uh, so he get, puts it in builder terms, but these are just metaphors. So he's laying the foundations of the earth. Uh, and he wants to ask Job, look, if you're, you're seeking counsel, uh, you, uh, in a sense, you want to you give me advice that how things should be, uh, well, were you there from the beginning of time? Do you know how all of this was done and what occurred and, and what the circumstances were so that you could actually give me some advice? So we can't be his counselor. And that's what this all comes down to. But he notes here in the seventh verse something that I think is rather curious and something that we might want to explore. And I decided, well, we will move into this only because one person in the room, Roseanne, said, I hope that you teach on the gap theory. So, uh, the Roseanne, this is all for you. I'm sure other people wanted to know, but they're, they're a little more timid about it. So we're going to go back uh, oh, here again in Genesis, this idea of the, uh, the heavenly host and the host of them. And my suggestion here is that, uh, well, when were they created? When did we end up with these, uh, these angels that were created? So, um, you know what, let me uh, back up here. And I want to stop this, change something real quick. So, we're going to take a commercial break at this time. <laughs> and I forgot to put this in there. So we're uh, when we talk about the gap theory, it's kind of an interesting expression, by the way. Uh, it's a uh, something that comes. Uh, now that should have worked just fine. Let's see. Oh, okay. I'm going to just take this one out. And that should take care of that. Okay. <laughs> 
Almost there, folks. So, what we're going to talk about is a, a theory that I, really, I have to admit, I bought into this early on in my uh, ministry because I was somewhat uh, enamored by uh, C.I. Schofield. It was the first Bible that I had received was a Schofield Bible. It's still an excellent reference Bible. But uh, Schofield had written this in uh, 1909 or had edited the version. And during that time, there was a movement that was happening in uh, evangelical churches. Uh, it was a, a movement of compromise. And it was, it's called uh, concordism, which is uh, you're trying to um, reconcile with the natural sciences. And uh, so what was occurring at that particular time is that, uh, well, Darwin had written his uh, Origin of the Species in 1888. And uh, there was a lot of movement even before that towards the idea of uh, looking at the Bible in some kind of a uh, mysterious uh, metaphorical way rather than taking it literally. And so uh, evangelicals at the turn of that century were having a hard time reconciling what science was coming up with, and particularly uh, the new science of paleontology, where they were actually, and geology, where they're actually studying rocks and finding fossils, and they're recognizing that they believe that the Earth must be much, much older than uh, what was believed to be 6,000 years. So they had a big problem with this. And uh, what they came, came up with in the sense of acquiescence was a theory. Um, and isn't it interesting? It's, uh, they go all the way, you go back in their Bible to the very first verse of the Bible. And between verses 1, Genesis 1, 1, and 1, 2, there's already a conflict, isn't it? It doesn't surprise me, you know, because the Bible is a conflicted book. There's, there's so many opinions about what it is and how it's to be understood and, and the hermeneutics of it all and so on. So it doesn't surprise me that the devil right away, you know, tries to mix something up right from the beginning. Now let me quickly say there are good believing people that uh, hold to the gap theory. So this is an in-house argument. So we don't, we don't want to call these people heretics. This is not her heresy. But it's a, it's a way of looking at things that I think it's intriguing, but I think it's totally wrong. And that is that they believed that in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Verse 2, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. What they say is that between 1-1 and 1-2, that there was a, some calamity that took place. And at that calamity, that uh, God had to recreate after that. So we begin with an originally perfect earth. Uh, and that's what the gap theory is all about. They believe that Genesis 1-1 is the earth. Uh, and uh, almost like uh, Rodinia, if you're familiar with the expression, uh, you know, where all the continents were all, all together. And I happen to believe that that's probably how it, how it was in the beginning, that it was just one huge landmass uh, with the oceans a single ocean. Uh, and that something happened called the Noahic Flood, which was catastrophism that actually changed everything. Uh, at any rate, they believe, well, God begins with this perfect earth. And uh, that uh, Lucifer is the anointed cherub that covered and was an authority over the entire creation at that point. And uh, all was well for uh, millions of years. So you see now, now science, we can say we got an answer to science, that there was an original perfect earth and there were millions of years of time that were involved in it. it gives us all the room that we need for theistic evolution that God could actually create uh, in this process that science claims is that life would spring forth from the lower forms and uh, through millions of years of time actually be able to evolve into a uh, highly sophisticated form. Thus man comes from the amoeba, uh, from the mud soup, you know, and after millions of years actually becomes a true man. So uh, that was a tidy way for them to uh, concordism, which was uh, ha having some kind of concordance with the scientific world. And that we didn't have to any longer uh, say, well, you know, you uh, believe in physical reality. We believe in spiritual reality. Now we could blend the two concordantly and say that, uh, you know, we believe in the same thing. Well, what happens, they believe, then, is Satan falls. And when Satan fell and was cast down, the earth then was judged as a result, and we have a chaotic 
uh, Earth now that is engulfed in a cataclysm, a diluvial cataclysm. It was believed that the whole Earth then was covered with water. And then uh, the perfect Earth, or the, or the new Earth, the future Earth. Now this is all, um, uh, if we go back to 1907, we've got Charles uh, Larkin developing these charts, and this is when dispensationalism really took hold. Now I'm a dispensationalist, uh, but not because it started in 1907 with Larkin, or maybe a little earlier than that, it's because the Bible indicates it. Uh, but he, uh, he did these artistic charts, I've always appreciated them by the way, but I don't agree with everything that's on those charts, including what you see here. He believed in the gap theory, and he drew it in this uh, original earth setting where you have the perfect earth, Satan's fall, the chaotic earth uh, uh, under deluge, and then the recreation, they would call it, of the present world. Uh, the six days of creation that you have in Genesis uh, 1, 2, and then on the way, uh, all the way through the end of the first chapter. Uh, so, uh, in fact, Thomas Chalmers, who was a minister and a geologist, was really the one to first come up with this in 1814, where he actually believed and taught a gap theory. And uh, so that's it's, it basically uh, it starts with him back in 1814, even before Charles Darwin. But again, geologists were finding these anomalous situations and they didn't know how to account for it. And they began developing, a secular geologists started to develop a, a science apart from the Bible. They felt there was too much contradiction. We can't fit it into a 6,000 year period of time. And they began a school called uniformitarianism where you actually believe that all the sedimentary uh, layers came one on top of the other, on top of the other, little by little. And as a result, it would take millions of years to develop this sort of thing. So that's where that went. And so again, the theologians are in a position of perhaps looking to be out of step. And they didn't want to be uh, in the uh, Galilean, you know, the uh, Galilean uh, mold, you know, where Galileo uh, had a problem when he looked out and he saw the outer spaces and so on. The Catholic Church wanted to burn him at the stake. So they didn't want to be in that kind of circumstance. We didn't want to be behind science. And so that's, that's how this began to develop as a theory, the, um, the gap theory. And they thought that'll answer for it. And of course, uh, when I had my Schofield Bible, I still do, I don't read the notes anymore, but there are some notes right here at the outset. You can see here, uh, note number three, and he goes here, the created acts of God are recorded in this chapter, and then the heaven and the earth, the animal life and human life, and so forth. And then he goes on to speak about this uh, concept of gap theory, and that there was, uh, there was some kind of catastrophe that took place when Satan fell, and that that plunged the creation into uh, this uh, uh, total deluge and then a recreation out of that. And uh, they cite, uh, and so does uh, all gap theorists cite Jeremiah chapter 4 because of the similarity of the language. So Jeremiah here, now let's not forget Jeremiah is writing in uh, 500 um, BC, so far removed from the Genesis account, I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form. So they said it was, and void. Those are the exact words that we find in Genesis, and so that's all some people need. And the heavens, and they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens were fled. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord, and by his fierce anger. For uh, thus hath the Lord said, the whole land shall be desolate, yet will I not make a full end. And so they use this as proof text that Jeremiah was actually hailing back to what happened between Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2. Because there's no other reference to such a cataclysm. And by the way, such a major cataclysm, we would have to say, you know, the paucity of any other scripture to support something that monumental is a little absurd. But uh, so they, they had to have something. So they latched onto this passage. Now, of course, you know, one of the great rules of interpreting the Bible is context. 
So you have to read the whole context. And what was Jeremiah referring to? Well, he was referring to the immediate judgment, the Babylonian judgment. And he was talking about how Jerusalem in particular was going to be left void and without form and uh, no man uh, because they'd all be hailed away and carried off uh, as captives to Babylon. But uh, they would not be utterly cut off and they would come back ultimately. So if you read the rest of the context, it, it, it'll put it in its proper understanding and we can interpret what it's about at that point. Isaiah also has a word that they like to use here in uh, Isaiah 24, 1, Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty and maketh it waste and turneth it upside down and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. The only problem again here is the context is uh, the kingdom and the coming of the king. And Isaiah 45, And thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it, he created it not in vain, he formed it to be inhabited. Uh, if you ask me, this verse they use a proof, a proof text for gap theory actually disproves gap theory. Um, God doesn't form things in vain. <laughs> he does it with purpose. Okay, so, um, all right, so we go back to this notion of how this kind of fits together in the gap theory. So we have Genesis 1-1, God creating the heaven and the earth. Uh, so, and by the way, I would add here, even though it says heaven in the singular, later uh, in the book of Exodus and later even in the book uh, in Genesis here, uh, the plurality is given to it, the heavens. So when he speaks of the heavens in a plurality, he's talking about the universe, the stars, the moon, the planets, and whatever else is out there that none of us even know how much is out there. All of that collectively. So the creation of the heavens and the earth. And uh, so then at that point, uh, they say, well, now there's a gap of uh, interminable time here, millions of years of time, and that that uh, is how we prove all the geological finds and the archaeological um, findings and the fossils and all that sort of thing. Uh, Satan's fall. So uh, Isaiah tells us, you know, how art thou fallen from heaven, Lucifer, thou son of the morning? And so he's cast down, and then we end up with this uh, judgment that God brings upon the earth in a, uh, a deluge. They believe that that's what Peter is referring to in Second Peter chapter 3. Then we have Genesis 1-2. Uh, uh, so after the gap then, God says, I'm going to start over, right? So the earth uh, ruined by the curse uh, that just took place, and now he's going to recreate. Uh, and that's what uh, the rest of chapter 1 is about, the recreation of the earth uh, done in six yams or six days. So that's where, that's where gap theorists are. Dr. Schofield is there certainly following Larkin and then following Chalmers. And then because of the popularity of the Schofield Bible, this uh, particular uh, gap theory became very popular amongst uh, evangelicals and Baptist institutions and so forth, even though uh, Schofield was a Plymouth Brethren. All right, so... And uh, I'd imagine most of you here have already been alerted to this, so that I'm telling you something new. You've probably heard this before. All right, so the, the gap theory in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Uh, so we want to take a look uh, at, the, at their argument, I suppose. Uh, they argue, and of course, this, uh, this almost always happens when you don't have a real strong argument, you usually go back to the original language. And that will always help you somehow, right? And I'm afraid I've done the same thing. But uh, so you go back and say, let's pick apart the words now. So we'll parse the words and we'll look at it and see if we can't make it say something that it isn't really saying. So they go back to the original language in the Hebrew. And that's why, you know, thank God for you have an extremely accurate English translation. We don't have to be Greek and Hebrew scholars. And uh, you can trust it very reliable. And the people that put together the King James Bible, I mean, as outstanding a scholastic minds. Nothing, nothing today compares with what those men had. So, uh, okay, so what we end up with, the word and, they say, uh, uh, that's the problem, okay, because as we'll see later, and if you can look in your Bible in Genesis 1, and you follow each verse, you're going to see each verse begins with the word and. And uh, the word itself, uh, so we have a Hebrew word, <laughs> uh, wa, which is nothing more than a, um, a conjunction. So they say, well, that's not what, it shouldn't say and, it should say but. So in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, but the earth was without form 
and void. And in fact, uh, they, they have another word here that they'd like to say. It doesn't even say was, it says became. So their translations will say, but the earth, um, the earth became without form and void in dark. In other words, this indicates that there was a cataclysm, that everything was good in the beginning and then sin came and uh, Satan had to be judged and this is what ultimately came from it. So uh, that's, that's the way they uh, use it. Now, of course, the, they don't have a reason to do this and we'll see that in just a little bit, but uh, uh, anything will do at this point for some argument. Um, actually, they took this word uh, and made became from it uh, because they went back to the Septuagint, which is a Greek translation of the Old Testament. And it uh, was uh, translated during the captivity of the Jews in around 200 uh, BC, the Septuagint. So what we do is that the Jews had become so Hellenized that they actually changed their Bibles and had a Greek translation of it. So, uh, so th these, these folks, desperate for an argument, go back to the uh, Septuagint and they find this word, uh, Egeneto, which just, uh, they say, uh, is the translation of this Hebrew word, which is always translated was. But they found 20 places in the Old Testament where this Greek word in the Septuagint was translated with the word became. And by the way, in the Septuagint, it's not translated became in Genesis 1-2. But then again, you know, for whatever argument they had. So, also they use this expression. Uh, that we find uh, later on at the end of the creation, God blessed them and get, God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. They make much about this and parse the word replenish and say, well, replenish means, look, it was there originally and then he had to replenish it. And uh, that sounds like a pretty convincing argument unless you don't understand Elizabethan English and, uh, and what does it mean? So it actually means filled. He filled the, uh, to, to go and fill the earth, not, not replenish in the sense of something was there and now I'm going to restock the shelf. We'll get into that in a little bit. Now, here are my arguments, I think the 10 or 12 arguments that you can use to debunk this gap theory. First of all, there's no mention of, uh, of creation. To begin with, it's, it's hard to imagine that the entire creation of the universe is passed over and only one verse, that'd be Genesis 1-1, and the bulk of the record deals with a recreation. Uh, according to the gap theory, there is no clear word from God concerning the original creation then. So the original creation, this which God bases his authority on, now how many times does he appear? I'm the maker of heaven and earth. How important that creation story is uh, that, that God not only gives it once in Genesis 1, and then he repeats it in Genesis 2 and gives us uh, a kind of a microscopic look of the creation uh, and a reiteration of the creation in Genesis 2. That's how important the creation account is. But if gap theory are right then, well, it was just really the recreation, the original creation. He just gave us a line on that. So that doesn't make much sense. Then there's the historical view, which, I, look, we can argue and say, you know, look, the, the, you, you don't want to go back to the patristic writings in these early church fathers and theologians because, you know, there's a lot of strange teachings. Uh, be that as it may, as you look through uh, the annals of church history, it was always considered by Jew and by Protestant and by Roman Catholic that the, uh, the account in Genesis is the original creation. Six days that God made everything that was. So the idea of a gap theory holds only one verse. So it describes the original creation. The gap theory dilutes the majestic account in Genesis of God's creation. We might also say Genesis is not a cryptic account where we have to, you know, that God is hiding something. You know, this was real popular, I guess, maybe 20 years ago. Remember they had the, uh, the Bible code 
everybody was way into that for a while. They were selling a lot of books about it. Now I think you can get the same book for 99 cents, but you know, they were hardback books about the, the Bible codes and that God had put cryptically hidden within the Bible, you know, where uh, the gematra and the, uh, the letters and the numbers, and they were giving us a cryptic message and God was writing in secret code. God doesn't write in secret code, but that's where they wanted to take this. And a lot of people think that's, that's so fascinating and interesting and you want to be real careful about gematria and so forth. But there are people that think in the gap theory that actually God was trying to tell us something but he was hiding it. And that we, he wanted us to figure it out and nobody figured it out until the 17th century. So yeah, that's, that's absurd too. So Genesis 1 written in a straightforward account of God's creation, not some cryptic record. If God had meant to inform us of a gap between first two verses, he could clearly have done that. There is nothing in the Genesis creation account that requires or even hints at a gap. Nothing has to be read into the account that is not obviously there. Uh, that no earlier creation taught anywhere. So there's no verse in all of Scripture that teaches that there was an earlier creation. Uh, because I'd have all kinds of questions about that. So, uh, so who was there? Uh, was this just for animals? Uh, were, were there men there? It, does this account for a uh, Piltdown Man and all the rest of the, you know, various uh, uh, cavemen? Is that what we're to believe? If so, uh, it, does Christ's redemption uh, cover them as well? You see, those are all the kind of questions you'd have to ask about an original creation. But we don't have a word anywhere in the scripture that would tell us anything about what that original creation was about, who the inhabitants were, how long it was, how long it took for it to come into being. So if there were a creation before Genesis 1-2, there should be at least one verse that explicitly says that. But, of course, there is none. And then, of course, contrary to Scripture, not only are there no explicit verses about a previous creation, the Scripture argues against the idea. So in Genesis 2, 3, and 4, it says, which, uh, which sums up the previous chapter of God's Word, it says, God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. It, to me, that answers it all right there. So he, everything that he had created was created in that period of time, six days, and then the seventh he rests. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth. So generations here means this is the history of, of, of the heavens. And notice the plurality of it, as I mentioned earlier, because the uh, gap theorists say, well, the earth was judged. Well, what about the heavens then? And were the heavens made at the same time? So the heavens are made. So the earth and the heavens. God made the earth and the heavens. And this coincides with what we find in Exodus 20. In six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. So these, this is what settles the matter forever for me because Scripture always interprets Scripture. Uh, so the matter becomes settled just from reading the rest of the Bible and comparing it. Now let's not forget that if you have this great cataclysm, was there death then? Uh, there would have to be. Uh, and you say, well, there, weren't, uh, there, were only, there was only angelic form and there wasn't human form. But uh, they're obviously animal form because that's what the fossils were all about. And they died in this terrible uh, cataclysm. So, uh, but death, the Bible's clear about death not happening until Adam and Eve sinned. So gap theory says that millions of animals lived and died not only before Adam, but also before the fall of Satan. But how could there be death in a sinless world? The Bible says that death was a result of sin. The Bible also says that the groaning and travailing in pain to the animal kingdom is a result of the Edenic curse after Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden. Of course, the verses that we would use, Romans 5.12, By one man sin entered into the world, death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And 1 Corinthians 15 tells us, Since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So uh, if there was indeed this uh, uh, conflict and God finally has to bring a judgment before the Garden of Eden, before the creation of Adam, how could death have reigned? And for that matter, if it did, and we've got millions of years of time, so if you have millions of years of time, one wonders, where are all the bones? So evolutionists also claim that there was a stone age of about 100,000 years 
So when between 1 million and 10 million people lived on Earth, uh, f fossil evidence shows that people buried their dead. Often the artifacts, uh, cremation was not practiced until relatively recent times. So if there was just 1 million people alive during that time, with an average generation time of 25 years, they should have buried 4 billion bodies and many artifacts. If there were 10 million people, it would mean 40 billion bodies buried in the Earth. So if the evolutionary time scale were correct, then we would expect the skeletons of the buried bodies to be largely still present after 100,000 years, because many ordinary bones claimed to be much older have been found. However, even if the bodies had disintegrated, lots of artifacts should still be found. So that, that becomes uh, uh, a question that they can't answer. Also, no direct statement of judgment is found. So there's no direct statement anywhere in Scripture that a divine judgment occurred between the first and second verses of Genesis. So while Scripture at various times does speak of God's judgment on the angels and the earth, there are no passages that speak of it being before the creation narrative in Genesis 1, 1, 1 through, through 31. Those who hold the gap theory must read it in uh, eisegetically into the passage. All right, so God made the world, but he made it very good, didn't he? So at the end of creation, we're told, God saw everything that he made, and behold, it was very good. So it's everything he made, and let's note the heavens and the earth, so the, the universe that he made, and it was very good. So in this verse, we have two superlatives, everything and very good. This could hardly be said if a part of the world had already been destroyed and if angels had fallen into sin. The gap theory builds a present world on the ruins of a former one. And how could that be very good? So in addition, the angels as well as the rest of creation were seemingly still in a state of perfection at the end of the sixth day. Everything was perfect everywhere. So, um, now those words that they were playing with, wa, which is a, a, a typical conjunction that's used, it's usually translated and, a uh, very simple conjunction, and it's coordinated conjunction. So they want to change it into a conjunction that's a contrasting conjunction. They want to say it's but, uh, when in fact that's, that's not really the way it reads in most of the cases, though there are places where it can be substituted and it can be reversed. So gap theorists attempt to make it the word that indicates a strong contrast to that which was previously stated. Yet it's merely a simple term for and. Wa is used thousands of times in the Old Testament without emphasizing anything important. To make it important in Genesis 1-2 is inconsistent with its overall usage. You'd have to do it wherever you're looking in the Bible and you find that word so many thousands of times. So a crucial doctrine should not be based upon one word, especially a conjunction. So instead of but, the verse should read something like, now the earth was, or and the earth was. Consequently, there's no grammatical reason to have that break. I mentioned already before, if you go through Genesis chapter 1, you can see each verse here I've underlined and, and, and. So you have a coordinated conjunction uh, all the way from verse 2, to the end of the chapter there, with the exception, I think, uh, verse 27, you have so right there. Uh, so the rest of the verses, though, uh, one thing follows the next and to the next. So you have a continuity of activity and action. Uh, in a grammatical sense, then, there's no gap between 1-1 one, one and 1-2, one, because the coordinating conjunction and uh, brings it together. And that expression it became so those who attempt to translate the word haya as became in Genesis 1-2 do so without any justification. So the normal rendering of the word is was. Most scholars testify that the translation of became in this passage is doubtful, if not impossible to uphold. Therefore, to base the theory on a suspect translation is wrong from the start. In other words, correctly translated and the earth was without form. So, and of course, uh, we already went over the, uh, the wa, you uh, translated and, and uh, we have other scholars that uh, weigh in on this concept and the idea of the entire interpretation of geology in Genesis is made to hinge on a secondary meaning of two Hebrew words, so uh, absurd. Let's not forget that Jesus also comments on what happened in the beginning. Jesus uh, spoke of it when, uh, about the original creation 
when he said, but at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female in Mark chapter 10 and verse 6. So he makes them male and female at the beginning, not after a gap of billions of years. And then um, this passage in Jeremiah that uh, we'd already referred to. Uh, the context of Jeremiah 4 has nothing to do with the original creation. And uh, so we already commented on this, the idea that really the prophet had in mind an immediate destruction of Jerusalem uh, and also uh, the forward looking towards uh, actually a revival and the bringing of the people back from that judgment. All oh, that's what the context of Jeremiah 4 is about. And with this word replenish, as already noted, uh, we have this Hebrew word mala, which it means to fill. It's the same word used in Genesis 1.22. And as I mentioned before, Elizabethan English replenish meant to fill completely, not fill again. So that kind of shoots that argument down. All right, I, I hope I haven't lost everybody on this, but uh, I thought it was important to know. So many places that we have, um, you know, people try to attack the veracity of Scripture. They try to uh, suggest, look, these are fantastical accounts, and you can't expect uh, sophisticated minds to accept a six-day creation. So they come up with various constructs, like the day-age concept, where there are people that say, well, you know, what we have here is progressive creation. Uh, we, we have uh, the days that the Bible is really talking about actually means uh, thousands and hundreds of thousands of years and that the, it's just a way of speaking you know and that's that's kind of the way they take it uh, or you have theistic evolution where God uses you know that God uh, can't just create instantaneously so he uses a process to bring it about um, so and then of course as we already discussed the gap theory of course, the Bible uses the word day many, many times. It's used uh, 2,301 times in the Old Testament. Each time it's the word yom, and each time it speaks of a 24-hour period of time, just like Yom Kippur. Uh, so we have, to, we have to decide how is this going to work. If we're going to believe the Bible and take the Bible's account, it's going to require faith, obviously, and it might not jibe with what modern uh, scientific evidence is uh, and the way they have their dating system. And, you know, they find a rock and they say this rock is uh, 100 million years old. And you say, how do you know it's 100 million years old? Well, because we found this fossil in the rock and the, ro and when the, the fossil is 100 million years old. Well, how do you know the fossil is 100 million? Because we found it in this rock. So it's circular uh, reasoning. It isn't necessarily intelligence, but it sounds intelligent. And the people that uh, espouse it, of course, all have advanced degrees. But I uh, want to be careful about how we date things and what uh, uh, uses. We have the carbon dating that really uh, has a half-life of 15,000 years. So after 15,000 years, and it's anybody's guess how something, how old something is. In fact, they have this, they found this uh, fossilized uh, uh, hat, right? And um, they, they dated it for 4 million years. So. I don't know. They must have. Fred Flintstone must have been wearing a, a top hat, I guess, uh, 400 mi million, four million years ago. It's, it's ridiculous, but that's. Uh, but they still hold by. They even have a Coke bottle that they they found, and they, you know, it's also been dated to be several million years old. So. Uh, so when you ask them the question directly about it, well, that's an anomaly. They say, we can't explain that. We don't really know why we find, you know, it, it's, it's dating that way. Uh, well, could it be that your dating system is bankrupt? So, um, and we'll just pass by all of that. So, uh, there are many other things that Job tells us about uh, in this account where God is actually instructing Job and what he's showing him is the might and the power of his creation. So even as he speaks of the, the angels that were created there, they were created on the fourth day of creation, and that they were singing uh, to the glory of God early on in the creation, even before man. But they were created during that time, and they were all good, and Satan hadn't fallen yet. It wasn't until after the six days of creation somewhere that uh, Satan fell. And between Genesis 2 and the beginning of Genesis 3, we don't know how much time elapses between those two chapters. I don't think we need to put millions of years there. 
Uh, but they, that's to accommodate the scientists that look at the Rocky Mountains and the Grand Canyon, and they say, well, how'd you, how are you going to explain that? Well, I think we have some explanation right here, in fact, when God speaks about, um, or, or who shut up the sea with doors when it break forth as if it had issued out of the womb. Uh, when I made the cloud the garment thereof, and thick darkness a swaddling band for it, and break up for it my de its decreed place, and set bars and doors, and said, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further, and here shall thy proud waves be stayed. It's a fascinating thing here. I don't know. Have you ever tried to carry a bowl of water across the room? What happens? I, I don't care how, you can have the steadiest hands in the world and you're going to spill that water, aren't you? And yet you look at the oceans, two-thirds of the uh, coverage of the earth is water, and yet it never spills over. And the, the, the mighty waves that we see, I mean, how fascinating to go to the ocean, you see these waves coming, crashing in, and then all of a sudden they come up right to the edge and God says, now that'll be enough. And they go back in passively back into the ocean. And what causes all of that? Well, the answer to that is a fascinating uh, study. Uh, and, and it's 8 o'clock, so I can't, uh, but next week I'll give you the rest of this, which I think is so fascinating, which has to do with the fountains of the deep. That God actually has fountains of water beneath the surface of the earth. And that when the Noahic flood took place, he broke open the fountains of the deep. And what, what happens is it created a tremendous undulation and an instant upheaval of land masses. So that the Grand Canyon, the Rocky Mountains, and other uplifts, it took about two days, maybe at most, for it to actually happen. So we'll speak about this next week when we speak about the hydroplates and the fountains of the deep. Uh, again, now why does God bring all of this up? Well, it was to humble Job. Job didn't know any of these things. And you know, man should, should just shut up after a while because they keep learning things. And what do you hear from them so often? They'll say, you know, what we previously thought was, and then you can fill in the blank after that. And then all of a sudden they see it completely differently because something new has been discovered that's changed their mind completely. And that, that happens so often, especially when it comes to a uh, phenomenon that nobody completely can understand. Uh, and until we adjust our thoughts to God's uh, infinite understanding, we stand in awe of it all. How much of it we can understand and discover, I mean, all of that can be for the good and benefit of mankind, but really at the end, we don't know it all. And that's what we're coming down to. And that's what uh, God returns to Job so often. Do, hast thou knowledge of this? Do you know any of this? And, and Job isn't saying anything because he doesn't know anything. And I should say the same thing, and you should say the same thing. What do I know? So then we begin to discover things, and scientists probe into the earth, and they start figuring some things out that they didn't know before, like the creation of diamonds uh, down deep uh, beneath the surface, and how, how the diamond uh, is cut down there. Well, I'll speak about next week. It's 8 o'clock now, so let's pray. So here we are, Lord. Um, all of us are willing to stand in awe of a great God. And like Job, Lord, we need to be set straight. And we pray, Father, that uh, we can take what we can glean from these few verses where you reveal some of your might and power. And you speak in terms for us, Lord, as humans that we might be able to relate to. When in fact the deep secrets and mysteries of your creative hand is beyond finding out. Uh, unless you explained it almost in childlike terms to us, Lord, there's no way our human in intellect can embrace it. But Lord, uh, little by little, you have permitted man to probe and to discover. All of this should bring him uh, into the uh, awe-inspired notion that thou art very great and your understanding is indeed infinite. Unfortunately, Lord, man by wisdom knew not God. And so many of them, as a result, become arrogant. And with what little they understand, they uh, mock God. Uh, may we never be in such a category. Help all of us, Lord, to walk all the days of our life in humility. And may we learn more and more of your mysteries, Lord, and delight in your law each day. 
board, uh, we spent most of the night here uh, debunking a theory that uh, has been espoused and uh, believed by many people for uh, at least 100 years. And we need Lord to uh, rightly divide the word of truth. And so we've taken some pains here. Hopefully, Lord, it will help us to a better understanding of what happened in those beginning moments, Lord. And you give us uh, the account almost in simplified terms. And uh, we're best just to believe it as it is, Lord. Instead of wondering how you could have done all this in six days, we should wonder why it would take you even that long. Because you could speak and it could all happen in an instant of time. So uh, we're glad, Lord, to know what we do know. And we pray that we, we'd be uh, wise enough in the things of God to walk humbly and to learn more. Thank you for our Savior who came and loved us and gave up his life to redeem us so we could live forever. Uh, we think of Job's awesome moment where he has to stand before the great creator. And so we will as well. And uh, if it were not for our advocate standing with us, we, our mouths would be stopped and we would stand guilty before you. But we are thankful, Lord, that you have given your life to save. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I invite you to accept the plan of salvation that God has laid forth from the foundations of the earth. And the first point of that plan is that all have sinned. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. So begin by confessing your sin before God, that you have sinned against Him. You can't even recollect all of the times that you've offended him. He has the record, and that record needs to be expunged. Secondly, it's important to know that God will punish sin. If it goes without atonement, we will pay the ultimate price. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that eternal price is hell, fire, and brimstone. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. But Jesus paid the price and made the atonement on the cross. God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. When Jesus died, he said, it is finished. He made an end to our damnation and our debt that we owed to him, paid by his own blood and justifies us before a holy God. On the third day in triumph, Jesus rises from the dead that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So call upon him today. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Amen.